just looking at the worship leader now. <laughs> Alright, I'll invite the worship team to come out as we prepare for uh, our time of worship. That's the worship leader's baby. <laughs> That was, that was crying. Yeah. She, Morning, church. She, he's really excited for worship. <laughs> I think is what it is. He might be joining us. No, he's not. <laughs> Morning, church. Should we all stand up? Get ready to praise God. Oh, dear. We're going to be introducing a new song this morning. It's called House of the Lord. And this is where we are. We're in the house of God. Yeah, it's, it's always such a joy. Um, there's a song that says, oh, better is one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere. And I think it's, it's great. There's so much joy in Christ's house, um, even as you feel this and even as we praise his name. So yeah, let me just pray and start us off in worship. Lord God, we thank you for today. We thank you for um, the joy that we can have, Lord, that is in Christ, Lord God. It's not where we are, um, it's not, yeah, where we worship you, Lord God, but Lord, you're, you just reside in us, Lord God, and, and we are your vessels, and we are your temple. And Lord, whenever we come into this house to commune with our, our family, oh Lord, and your community, Lord, there's so much joy, oh Lord, in seeing what you do in others' lives, um, and to hear testimonies and how great of you are, Lord God. Maybe even as we come together as a family and a community, maybe come and just praise you and lift your name up, because... That there is joy in this house. Redeemed by His grace, let the house of the 
Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Let's sing that joy again. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. Let's shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. Shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Shout out your praise. Yeah, Lord Father, we want to shout out your praise, Lord God. Lord, even as we sing this next song, it says, it's a Bible verse that says, you know, if I don't cry out to worship, the rocks will. Um, and yeah, Lord, we, we, we do want to give you the highest praise, Lord God. We want to give you the praise that you deserve, Lord God. This song is called Thousand Hallelujahs. This is a privilege in the last line of every verse. It's a privilege to be worshiping God, and it truly is. Lord, by the breath that you've given us, oh Lord God, may we, may we sing praises to you, Lord. With every breath that I breathe, oh Lord God, may it be a praise and a shout of, of joy, oh Lord, to, to what you've done in my life, oh Lord, in our lives. Let's just sing praises to him as a church. Who else would else cry out to worship? Whose glory taught the stars to shine? Perhaps creation longs to sing the words to sing. But this joy is mine. Good rocks cry out to worship, whose glory taught the stars to shine. Perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing, but this joy is mine. For a thousand hallelujahs, we magnify your name. You alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. For a thousand hallelujahs and a thousand Who else could die for? 
for our redemption. His resurrection. Whose resurrection means I'll rise. There isn't time enough to sing of all you've done. But I have eternity to try. With a thousand hallelujahs, we magnify your name. You alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is forever. With a thousand hallelujahs, we magnify your name. You alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand. thousand hallelujahs we magnify your name you alone deserve the glory the honor and the praise lord jesus this song is forever yours a thousand hallelujahs and a thousand With a thousand hallelujahs, we magnify your name. You alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs to a thousand. thousand hallelujahs to a thousand more, a thousand hallelujahs to a thousand more. Yes, Lord Jesus, you deserve the highest praise and you deserve it for a thousand years. I know we don't live that long, but Lord God, you you, you deserve the praise, Lord, for centuries and centuries, oh Lord God, Lord. We just love lifting your name up, oh Lord God, because, Lord, you just uplift our souls when we lift your name up, oh Lord God. When your name is praised, oh Lord God, there's just such power, Lord, in, in uplifting us and uplifting your soul, and Lord, there's just such beauty, Lord, who you are, God. We continue to just lift your name up high. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, everyone can sit down. All right, a very good morning, everyone. And for those of you watching us online, uh, welcome to BCEC. My name is Josh, and I'll be your host today. So if you're joining us here for the very first time, uh, or if you're watching us online for the very first time, we are glad that you could join us this morning. 
But before we start with some news and notices, there is a video we would like to show you. So if you can, someone hit the lights, please. Oh, what an amazing story and an amazing testament to, to God's power. All right, so um, explorers, you may go up to your classes now. Um, if you're here for the first time, I'm just going to explain to you um, uh, what age group. Oh, sorry, this iPad is talking to me. All right, so if you are ages three to five, you're with Little Explorers. That's with Jen behind, the red shirt. If you're in Junior Explorers, so that's five years old to eight years old, you're with Teresa. And if you're Grand Explorers, you're eight to 11 years old, you're with Sumi behind. I mean, Sue May. <laughs> All right, remember to sign your kids in and sign your kids out after the service. Cool. All right, we'll just, we'll just wait for the kids to leave the room. All right, but before that, um, here are some news and notices. This is what's upcoming in, the ch um, in our church. So this month, uh, we have the theme of God is. And next week, we have an interesting and exciting um, service lined up with a guest speaker. His name is Josh Shack. So a great opportunity for you to invite your friends or share our YouTube link with your friends. Uh, do take note that the first week of April is baptism. Um, so yeah, save those dates. Uh, Lent, if you have not uh, got onto the program, there's a QR code that you can uh, join in. Uh, we are in week four now of the reading, so uh, do scan the QR code. The blog post should be up already. Dragon Boat Racing, I, I managed to secure myself a place, so great. Um, but registration is now closed. We are looking for supporters, so people like you, if you, if you, can't, if you can't join... Um, do come for um, the uh, to support us on the 17th of June. It's a it's a a bit of a time away, but do uh, save those dates in your in your calendars. Uh, it's also for a good cause and for uh, the charity. Cool, and we are always looking to expand our team. So um, if you can help out, you know, with hosting like me or worship explorers or the tech team, uh, do speak to myself or Bert after the service. All right, we'll come to a time of giving now, but before I ask the um, ushers to come along, I'd just like to um, pray and prepare our hearts as we give today. Father God, as we draw near to Easter, we're reminded, Lord, that it is you who first gave your one and only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, and that now it is in our new nature to give. And Lord, as we give this day, remind us, O oh God, that we are owners of nothing, but mere stewards of yours, placed on this earth. And as we give this day, we pray for the leaders of this church, the leaders of BCEC, to use these funds wisely for the furtherance and expansion of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so if you're here for the very first time or you don't know the meaning of um, giving, you know, do let the bags pass you by. Um, but if not, please give. All right, that's it from me. Um, I'll pass the time now to NC to uh, share today's message. Thank you, Josh. He's a really good host, right? Yeah. We, we re yeah. <laughs> well, can I have my iPad back though, please? <laughs> Thank you. That was, that was really good. It's always good to have different voices on um, the stage, right? Because, yeah, it's, it's, it's a different feel, but it's also, it's a lot of fun. Uh, hang on while I adjust this uh, tripod. Ugh. Okay. So, we are continuing on with our God is series. And if you are here for the first time and you haven't caught up with us, you can catch up on YouTube. But otherwise, uh, yeah, we are going to continue on. Last week, Bert started us off with God is good. And now today we are doing God is hope. So in terms of God is hope, it's um, it's quite a it's 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 a good thing, right? Um, and oh, what's going on here? I'll try and control it here. Sorry, there's uh, many chefs right now. Okay, 
So, God is hope. So this is an interesting um, concept because actually, grammatically, I don't know if it works, but it's still the element that God is our hope. God is uh, the God that we can hope in. But what is hope? Let's start off with what is hope first. Um, Hope, the definition of hope as a noun, um, is to have that certainty, that assurance uh, or in the possibility of that something is going to happen, that, uh, yeah, something will be fulfilled. Uh, there's trust, there's anticipation, there's expectation, you look forward to it, there's assurance with certainty, the idea of preparing or envisioning. Um, and then, what isn't hope, okay? What isn't hope? Have you ever wondered what is the opposite of hope? What is hope not it's hopelessness, obviously. Um, it's also despair. It's not having um, a future, no hope, uh, no, no prospects. And um, sometimes parents might say that to the child. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not a parent, so I might have heard it from myself. Um, oh, it's just, there's no hope. No eyes to see. Uh, because, you know, maybe you had a bad parent uh, evening um your teacher was like oh if uh, your daughter gets uh you know good grades i will praise the lord and thank god um which my mother thought was uh, a sarcasm but anyway um so what does anyone know what this image is anyone know what image this is it is a clock but it is a famous clock Anyone? The end of the day? Nope. Anyone? 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 Something to do with war. So, this is the doomsday clock. So, the do. Oh, thank you, Abby, for you literally said it. Uh, this is the doomsday clock. What do we mean by the doomsday clock? Doomsday is the day that the world will end. Um, and it's basically what uh, the scientists, the atomic uh, scientists people have predicted based on a number of things through the years. And they actually started, here's a, here's a graph to show you. They basically started this doomsday clock back in 1947 for multiple of reasons, due to nuclear weapons and war and destruction and, um, yeah, weapons of mass destruction and all that jazz. But it is very interesting because through the years they do have predictions and it keeps going up and down closer to midnight. When it's midnight, it's basically doomsday, boom. Um, and, and as you can see, uh, in 2023, they published it in, in the start of January that it is now... 90 seconds to midnight, 90 seconds, because of the threat of war, the threat of, you know, um, all the different nuclear weapons and all the powerful leaders have access to and things like that. So it's quite scary, actually, because, um, yeah, and then, and then I think the furthest away that uh, we have been was 1991, and that was because the Cold War had ended between America and Russia, um, and they were kind of talking at that point in time. So things were a bit better. So that was 17 minutes to midnight. And so every year they try and assess, you know, the situation of the world leaders, the global landscape. And it's very, very interesting. But is it all just doom and gloom? Are we all just merely doomed? Is there any truth to any or anything, all of this? In some ways, it is kind of true. And um, this was one of the protests that uh, we, uh, me and my uh, godchildren and um, Ben and Mandy did. And uh, we were protesting for um, global warming stuff. And it was in Birmingham. It was very peaceful because, yeah, children were around as well. It was daytime. But yes, there is a lot of end of the world stuff. And I'm not going to preach to you about oh, you must repent, uh, the world is uh, ending soon, it's going to end on the 31st of January, da, 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 da. No, I'm not going to do that, because in the Bible it does say we do not know the time and date of when the world will end. Um, instead, uh, from generation to generation, we should still be, you know, prepared and ready and uh, 
realize that there is quite an impact on each generation that we have uh, for the next generation. Um, and so it, it's going to, yeah, the, the world is kind of in doom and gloom. It has been for a while. But today I'm going to talk to you about why we need that hope um, how God is our hope. And uh, yeah, what does that look like uh, to have that hope? But it first of all starts off with Genesis. Uh, why do we need hope? The question is, why do we need hope? So, as you know, I've just presented to you some graphs. But interestingly, the reason why we need hope is because of one word. And I'm not going to say it's because of sin. Um, yes, it kind of is related to sin. Is something that keeps coming up throughout the Bible uh, story, the narrative. Not just sin, uh, not just fear God, but it's actually, not even the word hope, okay? But it's actually the, this theme, this concept of this thing called exile, okay? So when it comes to exile, I don't know if you've come across this term, but in the Old Testament, we learn a lot about exile, not just the Babylonian exile, which we will talk about in a moment, but actually it started from Genesis. It started all the way from Genesis. Um, I'm not going to read all the details, but basically, in a nutshell, uh, we, we know that in Genesis 3, there was Adam and Eve, they got banished from the garden. Then Genesis 4, you had Cain being uh, exiled after murdering his own brother, Abel. And then you've got Abraham's calling, how God was telling him to go someplace to leave home. And then, and then after that, uh, we also have, oh, what's going on? I don't know what's wrong with the screen today. <laughs> anyway, um, after that was uh, Jacob having to move from Egypt. Well, no, not from Egypt. Go into Egypt during the land of the famine. So that, that happened. And then eventually... No, it's all black. Oh, we need, I don't know what's wrong with the screen. Today, how exciting. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. But I will continue to explain how, yeah, exile is, it just started from Genesis, the beginning of Genesis, and it continues even to, to this day. Uh, the fact is, is that even for us, we are somewhat part of this place called exile um, in a sense that we don't necessarily, we're not in the new creation, okay? Until we get the new creation, uh, until God, you know, changes and, and makes everything all well and wonderful, the Wi-Fi, it says. Sorry, I'm just reading it. Um, we are still in exile, okay? So what it means to be in exile is to be quite far, um, to be journeying, to be traveling through, that earth is not our permanent home. Earth is not our permanent home. Instead, it is just a transitory place. So even when you're walking down on Birmingham uh, New Street, you can see a lot of poverty. You can see a lot of rubbish. You can see um, maybe some questionable-looking activities. Uh, you see police trying to patrol as well, trying to keep some order. Um, German market time, you just have to be careful of pickpockets. I have been attempted a few times. And so these are very common things. We are in a world that is so not so great. Even our technology isn't the best. Um, yeah, this iPad can speak to me by a button, but sure. But yet, you know, the screen can sometimes fail us. Technology can fail us. The, the Wi-Fi, the network can sometimes go down. And the nature of life is that these things will fail us. These things are, aren't something that we can always place our hope in. Yes, we can have the latest and greatest toys and gizmos, but fundamentally, God is our hope. So what has being exiled got to do with how our God is our hope? To follow, I'm going to show you this graph now, um, the screen. Yes, because I spent a while on this graph. I copied it from um, a book. And it's um, God's big picture, okay? So this is a meta-narrative, is what we call in um, the big picture scale. And it's basically from the Garden of Eden, it started off well, and then it went downhill from there, okay? And as you can see, that line, um, that, that green line, went down, and then you build... Um, so eventually God called Abraham to go, and then it was Isaac, then 
Jacob, then Joseph, then Moses. So all these Exodus law, uh, conquests and monarchy, because eventually, you know, they wanted a king because they saw that other nations had kings. And they're like, we want a king. And then God gave them a king called Saul. And Saul was a bit questionable as well. Um, and then eventually the glory days was uh, actually David and Solomon's time uh, when things were going well. Uh, and even Solomon built a, a, you know, a temple, a big awesome temple during the golden era. And so eventually it all goes downhill, okay, after that little, little peak there. And it uh, basically gets divided up, the kingdom. You've got the north uh, is Israel and the south is Judah. But then eventually the Assyrians conquer them and there's lots of dispersion from um, the Israelites and so they had to spread out, um, which tends to happen when there's, you know, wars and uh, nations being conquered. You have to flee. There's a lot of refugees traveling um, if you're able to, otherwise you get held captive or you you get hurt. Um, and so then uh, after that was the uh, Persians. No, sorry, not Persians. The Assyrians, and then the people were fleeing. Then Judah is exiled to Babylon, okay? So the Babylonians conquered them. So this is a fast, fast picture, the overview of, you know, the Old Testament. And so exile continues to happen even after the Babylonians um, were conquered by the Persians. Um, and this is all very, not just biblical, it's, it's fact. It's part of the world's history in terms of, you know, different nations conquering different, different peoples. But the Persians conquered and they had control. But at this point in time, uh, which is kind of at the bottom of the, yeah, the mountain, um, it's when all the prophets were preaching. They were trying to preach this prophetic hope that, you know, there's a Messiah coming, okay? That the fact is, uh, yeah, the Persians were now in control. The Jewish people were subject to the Persians, and they had, they had permission to rebuild Jerusalem now and to rebuild the temple back to its former glory days. They had to pay taxes to the Persians. They had loads of, like... Uh, restrictions. And and that's where we learn a lot about the history. So at this point, when all the Israelites, they went back to Jerusalem, some people stayed, some people returned. But the previous generation, they could see that actually, this is not like the old days. But the young kids, uh, they were excited. They were, you know, they were learning about God. Um, Ezra and other prophets were, you know, reading scripture out loud. Uh, eventually, people started listening um, because, you know, they, they were like, oh, we don't know anything about this Torah. We don't know anything about, you know, God's word. It's very exciting. And, and finally, they, they got to learn about God's faithfulness. And, and I think because they could see that, you know, they went through exile. And so eventually, this happened, and, and we build. And then there's the, that's the end of the Old Testament. And when they're learning about, you know, God, God's faithfulness, they know that God will provide someone who will be even better than David and Solomon, okay? So they have that hope, okay? They have that hope. And they, they, they were holding on to that hope that, yeah, there is going to be a savior, a messiah, and that will help them return back to their former glory days and to no longer be oppressed by another people group, um, like the Persians. And then eventually, we know that the Romans took over, and um, then you get to the birth of Jesus, where, you know, just after 400 years of silence, you have uh, John the Baptist uh, proclaiming um, the Lord. He was one of the first prophets after 400 years of silence. And um, and the Romans were at that point in time, and then eventually, um, yeah, Jesus demonstrated that actually he's even bigger and better than um, David and Solomon, who fundamentally did uh, fail. Uh, but our Lord and Savior did not fail, and he was perfect in all his ways. And um, he was, yeah, he was uh, sacrificed for us. And then eventually you have the ascension, and then you have Pentecost, where, yeah, he ascended into heaven, and, and he gave us the Holy Spirit. So the, this is an overview of the Bible. And when you look at this picture, this God's big picture. It's a wonderful picture of how God has carried us through, through so many different elements of slavery and, um, and, and yet still carries us out of that into freedom. And that is because of Christ. And so because of all of that displacement, getting dispersed, having to flee, refugees, um, 
God provides someone greater. Uh, and we all know that God is our hope. Um, and, and that was Jesus, how Jesus was that hope for us as well. So what does God being our ultimate mean for you and me? So I have four truths to share with you. And, um, and I thought, oh, actually, this is a lot to cover. Like exile happens throughout the whole of the Bible. There's a lot of examples um, and, and we are short on time. But I do want to summarize it into, uh, you can read up on this in the book of Hebrews, which talks a lot about the Old Testament and how it was fulfilled through Jesus as our hope. But I will be looking at um, Hebrews 4, particularly. So the first point is, God is hope, therefore we have certainty of God's promise. And to back that up, it is uh, Hebrews, oh sorry, Hebrews 6. So it reads, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. So when we remember and when we read and learn about how um, Abraham was faithful and God blessed him, and what God did throughout each generation was to bless Abraham's uh, descendants and, and continues to bless even us today. Um, it is the concept of waiting patiently. It is even during the times of doom and gloom, we, the truth is we need to hold on fast, patiently waiting for God. We are part of his, his family. We are part of Abraham's family, the covenant, the promise, and that there is no one greater than God. Okay, so, so that is what it is. It's having the hope, um, which is that certainty of God's promise. So having certainty and waiting patiently. Okay, um, so an example of this was how, you know, sometimes we do rush because we want something really fast. So we take matters into our own hands and, you know, maybe, maybe some people, they'll be like, oh, I, I really want this thing. Um, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get it. And, and actually, sometimes it may not um, work out because maybe you took control and you kind of messed up God's plan. And, and so it's kind of like what happened with um, when Abraham got had that given that promise. Oh, yeah, he will have many, many descendants. And so he was like, okay, I'll take matters into my own hands. And, um, yeah, get, get the servant made pregnant um, because, you know, his wife Sarah at the time was uh, struggling to uh, conceive. And so many times we, we struggle with trusting God to provide um, because we're like, oh, I'm waiting for so long, waiting for so long. Oh, when is it coming? When is it coming? For me, it is um, the singleness thing. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I don't want to go into too much detail about that. Come to evening service because this is live streamed. So <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, then you have point two. Having hope is the certainty of God's promise. But not only so, God is hope. Because there's a double guarantee. It is double, doubly guaranteed. Uh, and it says so in God's word. Uh, Hebrew 6 reads, People... S wait, wait, wait. Did I read this one before? No, I did not. People swear by someone greater than themselves. And the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. This is really complicated, right? And, um, but let me explain one thing, okay? It talks about oaths. Now, when someone makes an oath, okay, what do they do? They stick maybe three fingers up or, like, they put their hand up, okay? Or they, or they swear by it, like... Uh, Anzi, did you go to the gym? I went to the gym. Yeah, right. I swear I went to the gym. Really? I swear on my, uh, you know, iPad, or I swear on X, Y, Z that I went to the gym. And then when someone actually swears or does the oath, like, I can confirm I did it. Like, it's, it's the affirmation that this is very, very true, okay? So when humans do that, it is confirming that I'm not lying. I am genuinely, genuinely mean it. Like, I swear by it. I, I promise you, this is true. 
And so when it comes to God's oath, God here, he doesn't just claim it, but he actually doubly um, claims it and that he adds an extra layer of promise by this oath. And it's the reassurance that, yes, he is telling the truth. God is not a liar. God is proving to us that actually he is, you know, he, he promises that promise to all of us, okay, that we are blessed and we will continue to have, we can have that hope in him. And so if we move on, uh, so that is having that double assurance of hope. Okay, double assurance of hope. And <laughs> recently I lost my hat. Um, actually, it was a couple of weeks ago that I lost my hat. I think I dropped it out of uh, Henna's place and Uncle K picked it up on, the, on, his dr- on them, their drive. And he didn't know whose it was. And he asked around and eventually it came to me like, is this yours? And I'm like, yes, it is. I've been looking for that. And I was so glad because, you know, I always, you, you, you know, we sometimes drop our scarves, our hats, our gloves. And eventually... Uh, last week, I was like walking out from Sue May's warm house, and um, I thought, oh, if only I had a hat. Came to church, and Andrea just passes me my hat. I'm like, oh, thank you, wonderful. And, and I was really warm that day. And then last Wednesday, I had my um, one of my uh, very first driving lessons back after a long break. And I was driving, and I was parking my drive uh, instructor's car into his drive, because he's a neighbor. And I wasn't meant to do that, but I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do it because it's a hill. I need to practice my hill parking. And, uh, and as I got out of the car, I see another hat that I had dropped. And I'm like, what? What's going on here? Like, there's another hat? Like, is this my hat? And it was covered with snow. And I was like, well, how long has this been here? And he was like, oh, it's, uh, I found it last week on the pavement, and I just left it on my wall. But what was funny was I would have missed it because... It wasn't in, in the, on the wall. It was inside his garden. It had fallen off into the garden. And, and I wouldn't have seen it had I not have driven into his drive. And so I think in this instance, God was reminding me doubly that these things don't happen, okay? These things don't happen by coincidence. God promises us, and he re- re- constantly reaffirms what he says again and again and again until we get a message that he takes care of us, that he loves us, that he is watching over us. And for me, it was the hat was God telling me that I'm covered, I'm protected. Um, I can take shelter and, and I can stay warm because, you know, we all need to stay warm, especially when there's snow. Um, and so I was really happy for those hats because, uh, yeah, I, otherwise I would have been without a hat for the whole of the snow time. Third point, God is hope. He is our refuge. We can take hold of that hope and be greatly encouraged. Okay, so we're looking back at the same bit here, but we're looking at the end. Okay, so it it reads uh, at the end of uh, verse 18. We have fled to take hold of that hope set before us, may be greatly encouraged. So the end of verse 18 is to describe that level of confidence that Christians can have in the promises of God. That the author is saying here, we have fled, okay? So when I was looking into this, where did we flee from? We are fleeing from trouble. We are fleeing from um, hardship. And that is fleeing into refuge. So different versions uh, talk about how he is uh, a God of refuge. And we, we tend to flee so that we can hide from that destruction. And it's the case of, uh, you know, the safety and security, a safe haven, a safe house during times of persecution or times of war or earthquake. When there's an earthquake or a tornado, what do you people do? They, in America, they, they go into people's basements and hide and they, you know, they want to get protection. Or, you know, if there's war, you, you want to be with uh, other people and just to have that protection. And so in this instance, um, Hebrews, it tells us that we have a place in God to take refuge, and therefore we can be greatly encouraged, okay? Flee to God because he is our ultimate refuge, especially when uh, should harm's way get in uh, to our lives, we can flee to God. We can come before him as a source of protection, as a source of comfort, and a source of you know help during those times. And through that, we have that hope, okay? We too are 
in exile. We are sojourners. We are just passing through. It's important to remember that we are citizens of heaven. We, um, when we are going through persecution or when we're going through famine or war or destruction or, you know, during the COVID times, I was looking forward to getting out of COVID. And, and there, there alone is a reminder that actually even in the midst of those hardships, we can take that refuge and comfort in God. Okay. And then point four, God is hope because he is an anchor for my soul. And so it reads on um, in 19 and 20. For we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So this, this concept here is um, that we can build our confidence and hope because of this image of an anchor. And this anchor image keeps coming up to me. Um, God always reaffirms it to me, like constantly to have hope, to have hope. And, and that is through the concept of the anchor. And it was very common for um, boats um, not back then and nowadays to still use anchors because otherwise you would be swept away by the wind and the waves. Um, and more interestingly, you know, they would actually physically take the anchor back in the old days and tie it to a reef and tie it to something stable quite some distance away. Um, but so there's the image of how, you know, we are actually protecting ourselves by staying securely fastened. Uh, and so this image of us being, uh, you know, oh, this hope is an anchor for our soul, is the fact that, you know, we can place our hope in him, in God. And it talks about the sanctuary, the inner sanctuary. So in the temple times, uh, Israelite temple, there was an inner sanctuary place where there was a veil. And that was the holy of holies. And nobody could step into that unless you were like creme de la creme, like a serious business, high priest. And very limited amount of people could get access to there. But the fact is, is that our, our anchor, we can, <laughs> we can have our anchor through, through that veil, you know, and it's behind that curtain. And um, what was that song? Uh, Christ alone. No, my anchor holds beyond the veil. All of that. That's all related to Hebrew 6 here. Um, and it's the case of, yeah, God is our high priest. Okay. God goes beyond and he holds us and he helps us. And we can be connected just like how an anchor um, helps a ship stay stable. Anchor our souls to him. Okay. That is one of the signs of maturity is when the fact that we are fully dependent upon God. Our faith and our hope um, continues to grow and continues to be more and more confident in God because of the fact that you remember the past, um, which prompts you to have faith for the future and to have hope um, because you're placing your hope and, and uh, in him. Okay, so... When we are anchoring ourselves to Christ, uh, no longer tossed by the waves to and from, easily affected by the world, um, really bogged down and depressed and cynical by the news and, you know, all the, all the big leaders in the world, um, you know, with the threat of them pushing any buttons. Um, we just need to remember that we have Christ, okay, and we can anchor our souls to him, okay? Um, we are secure in him. It's seen through Christ that God is indeed our hope. We can keep looking to Christ. And how do we keep looking to Christ? It is to remember that actually, despite all the rubbish that we see, despite all the drama, despite all, you know, many times I might forget something or fail or not do a good job, I can remember that God is still my hope. God, I can still look to God to help transform me, to give me um, a daily renewed heart, sanctifying me to become more and more like his son. It's seen at the cross. In the Old Testament, um, no amount of animal sacrifices, no king can be perfect. No, all the kingdoms rise and fall. There was people, you know, getting destroyed, uh, nations getting conquered. But fundamentally... Nothing can stop all that. Only Jesus alone is the ultimate sacrifice and the ultimate one who has the power to, um, yeah, heal and save and free and to love us. And that gives us hope because of God's miracles for the future. How we have a God that lifted Christ from the grave 
he raised him back to life. And, and to realize this and to remember this is to have that faith and hope in God and to have that refuge in him. Leveling up in hope, especially when we are feeling hopeless or full of despair, it's, it's, it's these three things. Oh, where's the third one? There it is. The Holy Spirit as well. So leveling up in hope, because sometimes, you know, our hope levels might be quite low. It's to have that faith in God's promise that he has promised us this oath, doubly so, that we are part of God's nations. Uh, we are in his uh, people group. We are part of this family. We are very, very much blessed. It involves looking to what Jesus has done, resulting in our salvation, okay? Because of what he did for us, we are now saved. And then it's also letting the Holy Spirit prompt you and to move you and to encourage you and to convict you. So this week, I, um, I really struggled with um, having some level of patience. And um, a lot of things were happening that was wasting my time. And I was like, you know what? I, I need to not have this grumbling heart. I need to, what is the perfect antidote for grumbling? It is to have a heart of thanks, uh, thanksgiving. And it's to remember how God has blessed us. And so I proceeded throughout that whole day to, okay, I'm thankful that I have, um, public transport is still working on this snow day. Uh, I'm thankful that the NHS kind of still operates and, you know, there are people that are still working in the NHS. I'm thankful for, you know, like, because there were so many things happening that day that was all going very, very wrong. And, um because it was the snow day, um, so that caused a lot of delays and a lot of trouble, and, you know, um, GP office was like, no, we're short-staffed, uh, you might have to wait, da, da, da. all these things, but it's still changing that perspective. Instead of having a heart of grumbling, it's to remember that what God has done, and I think that the Holy Spirit was reminding me that actually we are very, very, very blessed in so many ways, and many times we do dwell on the things that we don't have, or the things that are wrong, but instead the Holy Spirit wants to remind us that actually we are covered, we are protected, we are loved, we are secure in him. So in summary, having certainty and waiting patiently on God. Ooh, oh no, double assurance. And then it's also, oh, here we go, because I copied and paste this. <laughs> I keep blanking. Ah, I'll just skip it to all four. Flee to God, our uh, refuge. And then finally, the fourth one. Oh, come on. <laughs> Patience. Today with the technology. Come on. Here we go, finally. Ah. <laughs> hey. So as you can see, those four things are a reminder that God is our hope. God is hope for you and me, even in the midst of doom and gloom, even when the scientists predict that there are 90 seconds until the world ends. Um, it's a symbolic thing, by the way. Um, it's, it's great to be reminded that God is hope. God is hope. We have hope for things to come, things that will get better. We can't place our hope in, wholeheartedly in our government, in the people, we can't place our hope in um, certain individuals in our life, um, your spouse, your, your son, your family member. You can't place your hope in technology all the time. Um, and you certainly can't place your hope in items, um, material goods, in um, moving from location to location. There is no perfect place to live in this world. <laughs> um, I know for some of you guys, uh, you guys might have relocated from overseas. Uh, some of you guys might have been born here, but whatever happens, you will end up missing someplace. You will end up missing and longing to be someplace else, okay? Even if we are home, we're still like, oh, I really miss the food in Hong Kong. Oh, I would love to go back to Hong Kong. Or, or like when you're in Hong Kong, you're like, oh, I miss my life in the UK. Oh, life was so simple and slow and relaxed. And so wherever we go, we will be disgruntled. We will have a hard time, even if we're like, in a, on a wonderful beach, it's st you're still going to get the, oh, there's mosquitoes. Oh, I'm getting sunburned. You know, there's always, there's always going to be something. And the fact is, as humans, we can't place our hope in all those things, okay? But God is our hope. And our hope, we just need to remember that 
heaven is our home, okay? Heaven is that future place. And so he is the anchor for our soul. So stay connected. Staying connected looks like, you know, spending time with God, having that fellowship, um, walking with the Lord, abiding in him. And so let's, let's uh, end with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that, God, you are our living hope. That, Christ, you are King and you are Lord. You are so, so good to all of us. But fundamentally, in the midst of um, hard times and hardship, we know that, God, we can stand firm and know that you are our anchor. You are the anchor of our souls. You are the one that save us, saves us all the time. And so, Lord, may you, God of hope, fill us with all joy and peace in faith, and may it overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, that, God, you are our hope. You are our King, that heaven is our home. And though we are still here on this earth, and though we might notice the hardships, may we still be thankful that, God, you saved us, that, God, you still bless us, and that, God, we have that hope in you. So, Lord, we praise you, and we thank you. Amen. Should we stand to respond to the sermon? chorus of this song. Dark.
to the word, as well as we come to the sermon, oh Lord God, that Lord, our, yeah, our hope be placed in the right place, oh Lord, that it is in you, oh Lord God. Lord, we pray, oh Lord, for this victory that is to come, Lord, that we'll be singing about, oh Lord God. In verse 3, it says, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then him be found, Lord, dressed in his righteousness, oh Lord, faultless stand before the throne. Yes, Lord, we'll be faultless when we come to you, Lord. There's that hope, oh Lord God, that, Lord, we're sinless because you've died on the cross for us, Lord. Even as we declare for one last time, Lord, Lord that, our, that you are our cornerstone, that you are our Lord, that you are our hope. Let's sing. shall come with trumpets
great. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written oh Jesus Christ my living oh, yes, we could imagine we could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from the cross. The cross has spoken. I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Oh, Jesus Christ. Let's just sing together again. The cross is spoken. I spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own, beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my Lost its grip on me. 
you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living we thank you so much because you are our living hope and that even in this world we may face times of despair or worry God what do we have to fear because our life is in your hands you are the one who is victorious who has opened the way for us to be with God the Father so we thank you Lord because we do not remain broken but we are brought to life in your victorious hope we thank you our God who is so good, our God who gives us hope. So now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Please have a seat. Thank you again for joining us in today's